So the third lecture of this morning is by Jenny Weston, a graduate of the Medieval History Master Program at the University of York, Hugo, and is now appointed at the Leiden University at the video project directed by the last speaker, Billy Clark. She is writing a PhD, hypothesizing that the evolution of readership practice during the medieval period was not a universal process, but rather was often a collection of localized developments fueled by disparate motivations. And she will today talk about paragraph and paragraph marks in the 11th and 12th century. Um, these are, this is the, the larger family of the paragraph mark. We have the initial 
initial, the rubric, the chapter marks, and as well as uh, manipulations of space. While this larger family would be fascinating to study today, we're going to look at the individual paragraph mark. So what does it look like? What, what does this symbol in its medieval time really, uh, really stand out as? This is a brief, uh, if I can put it up, a brief table showing the most predominant forms of the paragraph mark in the uh, medieval text that I've been looking at. This comes from examining uh, just over 700 examples of paragraph marks, and these are um, well, some of the most, as I say, predominant. The top line, you see the simple stroke. Um, again, these are not, these are preliminary names. These are not official names. So uh, don't quote me on these, and I have no authority in calling it the simple stroke, beyond the fact that it's a simple stroke. So uh, I'm sorry, but it is a simple stroke. One line, uh, it's got a vertical, uh, vertical stroke as well as a little roof. This is helping to separate the following text. Below that, we have some embellished versions of the simple stroke. We've got a cross hatch, uh, which I've <laughs> kind of grimly called the hangman, and, and Dr. Eric Kaufman and I often <coughs> see this in our texts and know, oh, there's a hangman. But I don't even know really why we called it that, besides the fact that it looks sort of like a scaffolding. The bottom one is a little bit more self-explanatory as the harp, which it has multiple cross hatches. Beyond this, we have a few other examples um, <laughs> this, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> this one maybe I, just, I, I titled a little bit late at night, but it, it also stems from the simple stroke, but it's got a more embellished left-hand side. I thought that the first example looked so much like a penguin, I couldn't, I couldn't resist calling it a penguin. Again, this is not official. <laughs> don't, don't write this down. <laughs> um, and the last form is a very important one. It's different from the uh, original foundational stroke. It's it's derived from a curvature stroke um, creating the letter C. And as Malcolm Parks has noted in his book, Pause and Effect, The History of Punctuation in the West, um, this is, of course, derived from the letter C from the word capitulum. Um, for those of you who are in the audience, uh, many of you who study printed texts, as we noticed last night in your Cowan's lecture, as well as today in uh, Dr. McKitterick's lecture, we uh, have noticed a lot of these capitulum paragraph marks. And this becomes quite a standard, familiar mark within printed texts. So now that we're a little more familiar with the physical appearance of the mark, we're going to look at some of their functions in the medieval text. I argue that it was responsible for a range of different functions, all of which somehow augmented the, ability, or the legibility of the uh, medieval text for medieval readers. First, we find paragraph marks opening up new books. So in this particular example, which you can see up there, this is a wider manuscript full of Anselm's uh, opera, his works. This particular section is from the larger book, De Concordia Presentiae e Predestinationes et Gratia Dea Cum Libero Arbitrio. It's a long title. And this particular book is a, the latter half of that. So here the scribe needs to introduce the new book within the larger book. And he's done that with a hangman paragraph mark. Um, it's separated with a rubric as well as an initial. Now it looks like it's not really doing anything there because it's already got a rubric. But if you imagine taking away that paragraph mark, you run into some trouble potentially for readers. You've got restat nunc, the first line of the book, and then the title. If, if you don't have a division there, you can easily run into one line that becomes very confusing. In this way, by adding the paragraph mark, the scribe is able to distinctively mark the title of the book, as well as keep the first line of the text uh, without having to add a full space. So in this way, he's manipulated the space very economically. Um, doesn't need to add anything while making it very clear that the book begins with restat nunc and the title is De Grazia. You also see um, paragraph marks very commonly um, in combination with chapter marks. Um, in this case, you can see a little uh, they're, they're like friends, I like to look at them like friends, and that paragraph marks and chapter numbers often turn up together. In this example, you can see uh, the Roman numerals in the margins, very visible for the reader, and you have the paragraph mark essentially marking exactly where that chapter begins. This is particularly useful when uh, the paragraph actually begins within an actual long block of text. So in my next examples here, you have the Roman numeral in the margin, again, very visible, 
Well, the actual spot where that chapter begins is right in the text, and it's difficult to see, so I've circled it. And there's another one as well right here, and you can see it zoomed in with the hangman paragraph. Again, you see a, a use of space. The, the scribe did not have to add an entire new line, and yet it's still very visible for readers to see, ah, the chapter begins here, and the first word begins here. No need to add extra space. It saves on everything. So it's a very clever way of, uh, of manipulating the page. Again, we also have, uh, like modern paragraph marks, of course, um, in-text divisions to divide up very daunting passages of text. If I looked at this text, the top example, um, on a slow day, I would still be fairly afraid. Um, but we have uh, come, to our, come to our relief, a little paragraph mark right in the middle there. And uh, here again, the scribe is is able to divide up the text, but without using much space. While it's difficult for maybe a modern eye to catch that little symbol in there, to a medieval eye, I would think that it would be more likely he would recognize it. In the bottom, we have two more examples of hangman paragraph marks dividing up long passages of text. With this in mind, it's potential to argue the, the likelihood that by dividing up longer sections of text with little marks, um, scribes and authors are encouraging their readers to take a little break. To not necessarily go get a coffee, but at least to stop for just a moment and to think, what did I just read and uh, should I continue? Should I think about this a bit more? Should I reread it? Also, if you're a lost, a hapless reader in the middle of the night, you can find your way again by these little indicators. Finally, we, or, sorry, second, second, the penultimate function is the, um, Cases where we have very complex arguments uh, presented in text. Here the par paragraph mark comes in handy because it gives you a little bit of a division, marking out the main tenets of an argument. So this is an example from the Moralium Philosophorum um, manuscript. It's in the book De Magnificentiae on Greatness. And here you can find paragraph marks marking out each of the officiums, <coughs> the duties, which consist and comprise of being great. So um, the first one's not marked, but the second one you can see secundum, tertium, quartum, quintum, sextum, septum, and octavum. Um, again, it's very simple just to go bang, 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 got it, move on. And uh, that way you can really capture the, the, the argument without really having to read, read the entire text. That's it's a bad precedent, but um, it makes it much easier to reference. Finally, we come to the paragraph mark functioning as a gloss marker. So this is uh, an interesting use of the paragraph because it's not necessarily functioning as a paragraph but as a useful symbol um, and a familiar symbol to mark out something different. So here we have the paragraph mark signaling a marginal gloss as well as an interlinear gloss. I think that the paragraph mark in this case is being used because it's a familiar symbol as I mentioned. The scribe can I think he needs to essentially mark out the gloss with something that's not a letter or, or a number that's going to be confused with the main body of the text. So you've got to come up with something that would be familiar, yet not confusing. So the paragraph mark, I believe, is a, is a suitable candidate for that. It's a familiar mark. It essentially means in all of its uses, stop, look here, something's happening, a new book, a new chapter, and here, a gloss. And it would also be likely recognized by medieval readers because they would see them in other mass facets of their texts. So moving on, um, thus far I've argued that the paragraph mark has many different styles and many different functions. But because this is a, a conference about traditions and evolutions, I thought it would be, be sensible to sort of look at how the paragraph mark has journeyed through time. This is a very brief look at how it's journeyed through time. It does not give it justice. To create an effective uh, chronology, I had to use a corpus, of course, of dated and datable manuscripts. Um, my results are preliminary, but uh, they do indicate some change, and I thought it was enough to, uh, to show you the results thus far. So in the 9th and 10th centuries, surprise, surprise, it begins simply. <laughs> I don't know what chronology really begins horrendously complicated and then simplifies, but this is a, a normal a chronology. So we have the simple stroke. Here you can see it in a number of examples. In the 9th and 10th centuries, we often also see the we also see the paragraph mark um, existing almost always as a chapter mark. 
it almost, I mean, there's always ex um, exceptions to the rule, but from the corpus I have looked at this far, this is very common to see the simple stroke and with a, a Roman numeral next to it, marking out the chapters. Interestingly enough, some of these early examples, it's very rare to see the paragraph mark separated from the Roman numerals. So, like we had seen earlier, the, the Roman numerals in the margins and then the paragraph mark marking the exact location. In the 9th and 10th centuries, uh, it's very rare to see that. It's more of a broad indication that something's happening in that section, sort of that way. In the 11th century, uh, despite my title, which said uh, paragraph marks in the 11th and 12th centuries, I'm, I'm a little excited about the 11th and 12th centuries for other reasons. Uh, there's lots of development happening, and I, I sort of assumed that the 11th century would also show some radical change. But in paragraphs, surprisingly, they're just like the 9th and 10th. So um, nothing that exciting for, for just the corpus I've looked at so far happened in the 11th century. Again, we see a simple stroke and the introduction of the hangman, but uh, again, almost always marking chapters. Now, it's the 12th century, the, the famed 12th century, where the paragraph really takes on uh, a chaotic personality. It's a, a period of great paragraph experimentation. This is the period when everything exciting in the paragraph world happens. It's true that some things can be exciting in the world of paragraph. Um, this is where I saw the most wide-ranging development, and this is a period where you can find examples of style and function right across the board. You can look at one manuscript from the early 12th, and it has the harp and the chapter mark, where you can see at the end of the 12th century, also the simple stroke, but used as a in-text divider. It's, it's all over the place. The last part of the century, or I guess I should show you some of the slides. Here you see the, the harp coming into play. The top we have, um, I guess I can use my, oh, you can see it. Um, it's marking a chapter, as, as, as is common. And it's also in the top left example, no, top right example, is uh, marking out the voices of, in, a, in a dialogue text. You also have an uh, in-text divider below, as well as the last example. There's more examples. You also see here a harp marking out a gloss. You also see an elongated simple stroke with an extra large uh, stroke, and that's again marking up a gloss. And finally, you see the introduction of the penguin, and uh, the and again it is marking up a gloss. And you can see variations in the styles, but essentially at the same time you see quite a uniformity in the way that they're presented. Now, in the late 12th century is when we start to see it die out a little bit. It starts to sort of settle. And uh, this is the period where you really see the capitulum chapter mark really taking strong footing. Um, again, you can see other types of paragraph marks show up now and again, but this one really takes the cake. Uh, the capitulum chapter mark really gets its footing. So, towards the early part of the 13th century, this is almost the most common mark you see. Uh, as with the function, unfortunately, I don't, I don't feel strong enough to say that the function has also become more uniform. Although I'm tempted to say, I just said I wouldn't say, but I'm tempted to say that it is also sort of becoming a bit more uniform with less, um, less all over the board functions in that it's almost always dividing up the text, um, the main sections like a chapter, or it is um, working as a gloss marker. In the 14th and 15th centuries, you continue to see the capitulum chapter mark, paragraph mark, um, represented most exclusively. So we have, again, this is the, also the precursor to uh, our modern day Pilpro, the one that we have seen in our programs today, except our program had a much more beautiful version of this Pilpro, uh, besides this one. And you can see here that, you can still see the C chapter mark, the capitulum, just with two elongated strokes. So essentially, the modern-day paragraph that we use today is really, um, is, is, its grandparents are really from the medieval period. I'd like to end here today with just a few conclusions, brief conclusions. First, we've seen that the paragraph in the medieval period can take on many different styles. Over time, it gradually moved from a very simplistic stroke to something a little bit more embellished, with the scribe adding additional strokes and elongated lines eventually moving towards the capitulum format, and thus uh, our modern mark. 
Second, we have seen that the, period, uh, the medieval period saw the paragraph mark take on many functions, uh, including signaling opening of new books and chapters, textual divisions as flags for important points with an argument, and even a symbol to mark out the gloss. Third, I would think that the most prolific period of the paragraph development was the 12th century. This period, again, we can see just every style and function of this paragraph mark, as, as, if, as if the scribes are really just testing what, what do readers really like in this period? Um, can, I, can I add this um, extra stroke here and will anybody notice? And uh, what happens if I use a paragraph two times and it's going to be slightly different? It's just a period of kind of exciting, enthusiastic experimentation. It's clear that despite what the paragraph mark is actually doing specifically, the underlying purpose of these little marks is to help readers navigate their text more easily. Indeed, the, pre the presence of the paragraph mark in the text helps us decipher how this text may have been intended to be read. They show, they're, they're like a little road map. They're showing us how readers uh, were encouraged to pause, where they should begin, where they should follow a specific argument, where they might find a marginal gloss. So for us as historians of the, the book, um, they're like little flags saying, hey, you can find out how this was supposed to be read if you just pay attention to ridiculous mark. By following the paragraph marks, we see that readers in the 12th century in particular were reading shorter passages at a time, broken up with the paragraph mark. We're all, they were also able to reference texts more easily. It was easy to see uh, chapter numerals in the margins, while at the same time looking at the in-text beginnings. They were also found to demonstrate more complex argumentation presented in sequences. So, primum, secundum, tertium, quickly, you can just pick them out very easily. And they're also creating and using ever more complex law systems to engage in commentary and discussion of the text that they were reading. While the later medieval period saw and beyond saw the paragraph become a more simplified symbol and more uniform reading aid, its enduring presence within our modern day texts, such as our programs, should be partially attributed to the development and refinement that it experienced in the medieval period, where this reading aid, I think, was tried and tested by scribes and readers. So when we look at this paragraph mark today, um, I would hope that we can appreciate how far this little guy has come and how far the journey across ever-changing mediums and a, a great expanse of time it has, in short, I believe the paragraph mark is a true survivor. Thank you very much.